Welcome everyone to Boots on the Ground, a session showcasing some innovative and exciting African businesses and what the drivers of success for these entrepreneurs have been. By now you've seen and heard way too much from me, so I'm gonna dive right into our, our panel introductions of three successful entrepreneurs in their own right. We have Mike Quinn, who is the co-founder and CEO of Boost Technology, helping informal small businesses thrive in Africa's digital economy. Uh, Jason and Joku with one of the best backgrounds I've seen today, um, who is the co-founder and CEO of Iroko TV, um, Africa's leading entertainment technology company, providing pay for Nigerian films on demand. Um, and a good friend of mine, Ikena Nzui, who is the co-founder and CEO of Relief, um, an agri-tech startup that develops hardware and software solutions to drive industrialization of food processing in Africa. Now this panel wouldn't be balanced without covering both sides of an entrepreneur's journey. So from the investor side, we have the wonderful Alina Trujina um, who's moderating and she is the chief strategy officer of Founders Factory Africa, a tailored tech enabled corporate back venture um, that builds and scales Africa's ventures across the continent. I'm personally really, really excited for this one. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass off to Alina and our panelists to to take us through their entrepreneurial journeys. Thank you, Noe. And thank you for joining us this afternoon and a warm and very special welcome for everybody who is joining outside of Oxford and perhaps outside of the UK uh, and hopefully from all over Africa and, and the continent. As Noe said, my name is Alina Trujina. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Founders Factory Africa. And as the title of the session suggests, today we'll be exploring the realities of doing business on the ground on the continent and building the tech startup ecosystem. Many of you may already know and be very well aware um, that Africa and African entrepreneurs uh, face an incredible growth in the last decade and they have achieved so much. Uh, just in last year alone, in 2021, we've seen over 600 tech entrepreneurs um, raise over 5.2 billion USD from venture capital. And that's according to Partech. Uh, there are other numbers out there and uh, depending on methodologies that they use, but the incredible achievements uh, uh, attracting investments from the likes of Tiger Global, from Sequoia, the leading VC out there uh, in the world and SoftBank as well. So how and why does one decide to become an entrepreneur and start a tech venture on the continent? What risks does an entrepreneur uh, take to start and build a venture in Africa? What support do the entrepreneurs get from enablers and investors on the continent? And how does one scale the startup in Africa? What does it entail and what cost? These are some of the areas that we'll be unpacking today. And I'm very excited to learn about the founders' journeys and look under the hood about the decisions that they had to make along the way uh, and, uh, and, 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 and what they had to do to get there. Uh, we'll hear some of their insights about operating in the various uh, African markets. Uh, again, Africa is uh, a very uh, divergent place with many different countries. Let's not forget that. And how these changed with the evolution and the growth of the African tech ecosystem, as we mentioned. I'm privileged today to be with three incredible entrepreneurs who are very different in their journeys. They've uh, all achieved uh, very different uh, uh, growth of their startups uh, and, uh, and in many different sectors as well. So without further ado, I'd like to ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So if you could share a little bit about yourself and perhaps a, an elevator pitch about your venture, but also the insight that led you to start this venture uh, in the first place. So Ikena, maybe let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Happy to kick off. Hi, everyone. I'm Ikana and Zoe. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Relief, and I'm joining you all from Lagos, Nigeria. Um, to do a quick elevator pitch for Relief, uh, essentially what our company does is we develop technology, both hardware and software, to power Africa's food processing future. So we've started in Nigeria's uh, vegetable oil sector, and we basically supply vegetable oil to large food and consumer brands. Um, so to basically supply these guys with top-notch vegetable oil, we literally invented an industrial nutcracker and it's called Kraken. So our business model has like three steps to it. Uh, the first is that we use geospatial software to figure out exactly where we should place those Kraken facilities. 
What's nice is that uh, oil palm trees grow at the top of the canopy, so you can see them from space. So you can use machine learning and data analytics to figure out where the trees actually grow. Second, we set up the factory and we start buying nuts from smallholder farmers. We offer them financing as well as uh, agronomical advice. Um, and then third, we actually do the nut cracking uh, of the palm nuts into vegetable oil um, and then supply vegetable oil to large consumer brands. Um, so our objective as a company is to continue developing uh, different pieces of hardware uh, and then to use software and basically financial instruments to basically propagate the expansion of that hardware because Africa needs a better primary food processing industry. Um, I did not come to this understanding through my education. Um, so I grew up entirely in the United States. I came back to the continent for the first time when I was 20 years old. Um, but after I graduated from university, I was fortunate enough um, to travel all over Nigeria. So I went to about 20 states and traded eight different agricultural commodities. And the main thing that we noticed was that raw crops were being transported from farms very far away from where the really big food and consumer brands were. And there was a lot of post-harvest loss. There were really high logistics costs because most of those, those crops weight is actually just waste. Um, and so what the continent needs is a more decentralized food processing industry to complement its more decentralized uh, means of agricultural production. Um, and that's what Relief is trying to power. Thanks. Fascinating. Welcome, Ikenna. Thank you. Mike, let's turn over to you. Sure. I, I don't know if I can uh, if I can do that justice to follow up. Uh, thanks for sharing, Ikenna. Sounds very exciting. Uh, very pleased to be here. Um, so I'm probably the only non-African on the panel. I, I come from Canada, but I um, moved to Africa in first in 2003 and, and lived in Ghana, Zambia. Um, then I actually did my MBA at Oxford and then moved back to Zambia and co-founded uh, what became one of the, the early fintechs on the continent. Uh, it was a company called Zona uh, that I grew from 2009 to 2019. Um, we were trying to replicate uh, M-Pesa, which was the big mobile money platform in Kenya, and, and take it into a, a new region, a new market that um, was pre-smartphone, entire cash economy, um, ended up growing it to process about two and a half billion dollars of transactions and, and serve a, a quarter of the adult population in, in Zambia's active customers. Um, unfortunately, I, I wish it was a, a huge unicorn success story and an exit. Um, and, uh, but I, I left in 2019 and, and ended up writing a book called Failing to Win. So not to be mistaken for Jack Welch is winning. Um, this was Failing to Win. Um, and uh, we, we had some, uh, when I left, uh, uh, looking back at like all the ups and downs of entrepreneurship and, and being on a startup journey, um, I actually realized like it was, it was a disappointing exit. Um, or exit for me and, and outcome because um, we, we had a whole bunch of things happen at the end of funding around collapse and competitors attacking us and market shifts. Um, <clears throat> but just how much um, of the success we had was the process of failing and failing and failing and failing in order to win. Um, and that really gave me the inspiration to start Boost. Um, so I, I set off uh, in early 2020 um, to design a completely virtual company a platform business that could operate across multiple African markets. Then COVID hit, so I, I was a little bit ahead of, ahead of the curve there, but um, Boost is a B2B commerce platform, uh, powering growth for convenience retailers in Africa. So mom and pop shops that are selling food, provisions, pharmacies, um, restaurants, fruit and vegetable stands. Uh, we have an ordering um, and working capital stock boost platform um, and a full backend for distributors to do uh, fulfillment. Um, all the way from buying and inventory management to last mile delivery. And we're up and running in Ghana, Nigeria, uh, South Africa, and a pilot in Egypt at the moment. So thank you for having me. That's incredible. Thank you, Mike. And I'm very humbled by the openness of you sharing your journey. I think it's incredibly uh, uh, powerful uh, for others to see. Uh, last but certainly not least, Jason. So you have some real, like, hardcore entrepreneurs they're doing real like hardcore stuff um mike i actually bought your book so it's on, it's on my reading list so it, i'm definitely sort of a fan of what you've done at zona i used to spend a lot of time in zambia so i've definitely seen your kiosks and stuff so definitely a big fan of, of obviously the, the attempt um and obviously the openness and transparency um so in really simple terms like you know 
I'm essentially trying to monetize um, creative industries of, of Nigeria, right? Um, you know, one thing that, you know, Nigeria has a reputation for its ability to enjoy life, to party, to have a very uh, expressive, like, you know, robust and, you know, just loud, um, whether it's movies, music, our churches, just our very being, right? So I'm essentially just trying to figure out how to monetize that. I've been doing it for, for close to a decade. Um, obviously, when, when I first started, um, you know, the, the creative industries in Nigeria were, were large, but mainly within Nigeria. And I guess I've, I've been trying to build that bridge to the rest of the world and try to figure out how to monetize that wherever it may be. Um, and I, I've largely been plus, um, sort of platform agnostic and just sort of focus on trying to figure out like where the, where the money is. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, 99% of the actual um, uh, excitement and energy around creative services goes to the creatives. And then the people who actually build the business is sort of like, you know, doing the infrastructure stuff in the back. So, you know, ha- happy to largely be out of the line like just focused on essentially trying to, trying to sort of like really scale the, 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 the excitement, the, the, the creativity and, the, and, and obviously like the energy of, of what essentially is like Nigeria and West African content. Incredible. I'm looking forward to learning more about that and maybe getting a lesson on the NFTs and Web3 from you as well. <laughs> we can slide that in. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you and welcome again to the three entrepreneurs. Um, please uh, uh, be reminded uh, that we have a chat function on swap card. So the audience, as the session continues, please, please, please feel free to uh, send in your questions, your comments, uh, your inputs, and we'll pick it up on the back end. And we will leave ample amount of time for Q&A from the audience. So please do that. So without further ado, let's dive into some questions. And again, I'm going to come straight to you or back to you. Um, and I'm very curious to learn more about your journey um, or, or the start of your journey, rather. Uh, you obviously have a growing C-stage uh, uh, business. Uh, I think you closed 4.2 million last year. Congratulations on that. Um, and you've co-founded, as I understood, the business whilst you were still at university, at Yale, I must add. And we're working at Bain & Co. at the same time in the private equity division. So I'm curious, what made you want to become an entrepreneur? And how did you make that decision of pursuing the riskier path of building a tech startup rather than continuing on with the consultancy gig? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think I was always called to be an entrepreneur and maybe even a food entrepreneur. So when I was 14 years old and a freshman in high school, I started like selling snacks to friends like in my like gym class and band class. Um, But that very quickly became... Uh, a business of me importing watches and phone cases from Alibaba and selling them in my in, at my high school as well. So um, the little proceeds that I made from doing those things in high school paid for like a lot of my trips um, and other things I was able to do like while I was at Yale. Um, so there was a part of my time on, on campus that was like very focused on the pre-professional track, you know, trying to land a job at a consultancy um, and then also continuing to nurture this interest in entrepreneurship. So I had always believed that I would do something back on the continent, but I saw it as a career path, perhaps after business school or kind of at like the mid-career point. Um, But to be very honest, I was um, inspired by companies uh, like Iroko, like Andela, that like, wow, you could actually start a tech startup like right now. You don't need to wait till you're 35, 40 years old, like tech in Africa, you can do it right now. Um, And so from there, I I had to start thinking about like, okay, what would I do in this industry? Um, What could work? Um, And agriculture just stood out as an industry that I took a lot of interest in. I feel like there was a lot that you could read about agriculture. And that ended up being a little bit of a, a, a mistake to a certain extent, because I would just sit in my dorm room and like read agricultural reports and really try and get my my head around the problem. And then we would create solutions that were actually very like ill-fitted, Ill-fitted for, for the market as a result of not having the local context. Um, and so after I graduated from university, um, we got into Y Combinator that summer as well. Um, so after we finished Y Combinator, I was able to um, basically defer my start date at Bain for a year um, and move back to Nigeria and build the business. So the goal was, you know, if you can get the business up and running and it's doing really well, you don't need to like go into consulting. Um, so we had planned to build like a more software based ag tech company, but the more time we spent in the market, the more 
glaring of a problem like the primary food processing was. Um, and we felt like we needed to adapt our strategy to actually play in, in the real world to develop like hard technology. Um, and so for that reason, I went back to Bain to develop like a business acumen to actually set up a real sector business because uh, it's there. They can be a little bit more complicated when you have things to manage, like working capital, depreciating assets, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, a, a group of like smart computer science undergrads like are not really the best suited for that. So I spent a bit of time um, at Bain while we built our first factory. Um, and then moved back to Nigeria like 12 months after I started at Bain and, and kept pushing on with relief. What an amazing start. I wish I was the fly on the wall when you were resigning at Bain to hear that discussion. <laughs> Must have been a very interesting one to say. I'm becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for sharing that. Well, you mentioned, uh, I recall you mentioned uh, Jason. So Jason, I'm going to come to you next, uh, but I'm not going to come and ask questions about Iroko, which is probably very obvious, although there will, I will slip one in later on. Uh, but let's talk about Spark. I'm very curious uh, about Spark and a key part of your proposition is to actively support the entrepreneurs and so not just putting in cash or not just writing uh, checks. And this is something, uh, this is a model that very much resonates with Founders Factory Africa. We too believe that, um, especially at early stage, uh, you need to provide tangible and hands-on support across sort of product and growth and investment in other areas. So tell us why you decided to go for this model when you launched Spark in 2013, I believe, um, as opposed to a traditional VC venture capital uh, uh, model. And do you think that there's a trend towards startups and investors recognizing and actually actively requesting this level of operational support um, over and above just cash? Yeah, no, so I think if you roll back to 2013, there were very few startups at all in, 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 in essentially Nigeria, um, where I was at the time. Um, it's very much sort of focused on the big sort of Jumia Conga battles. There was nothing really happening in fintech. You know, there definitely wasn't a flutter wave. There was no pay stack. Those things, you know, with a few more years to come. So there wasn't really like companies and it wasn't really much capital, right? So those who wanted to start companies, you needed to give them way more support then than what any company will be able to get now, right? Um, so I think first of all, but it's like, you know, in order to build the companies, we knew we'd actually have to be very, very long-term in, in our approach to that. Again, you know, if you look, if you took it, take that window. Um, on, on the other side, like, you know, I never... I was never 100% sure that I would even enjoy being an investor. Um, you know, when I, when I think of, you know, when I think of at least my experience with my investors, it's usually problems I bring to them. And what I didn't want to do is essentially take my own problems as being an operator to work out. And then like 20 X, there were like 20 other entrepreneurs who were just like, every time I ask them how things go in, they give me a hundred reasons why everything's going to go to, go to, you know, go, go to zero, right? So I was a bit con concerned personally if I actually uh, enjoyed investing or not. Um, to be honest with you, I don't really like investing. Um, I, I find it I find it easier to um, be, I would say, like less engaged now. So right, right now, and I, I think I realized that the best entrepreneurs, you give them money, you get out of the way, unless they specifically ask you for something. Um, so I, I think that's, that's very much the model that people are doing now, right? You know, you have people who are doing like 50, 60, 70 deals in a year. There is, I'm sorry, there is no way you can add any real value if you have like 50 portfolio companies per year. You're essentially like, you know, an, almost like a, an, an index of Nigerian or, 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 or Ghanaian or whatever, African startups, if you're doing like 50 or 60. Um, and to honest you, to be frank, like most entrepreneurs right now, they're, they're fantastic, right? They're way more, um, you know, sort of savvy than what we were then. They're way more understanding of the development tools available to them. Again, the development tools available for them are way more easier, like, you know, incorporating companies around the world, like essentially like, most of the most of the, the guts of actually building you know companies of large essentially can largely be um, you know outsourced these days around payments and various other things right so you know what the guys are doing today have fantastic valuations they're building real companies of real value uh, you know I think the valuation is a bit on a bit on the higher side but you know that, that's me like an old guy right you, you sort of like been in, been around for a while um, so I, I think my view is that one um, it takes a very very long time to build a company. Um, you know, your seed round, whatever, your seed round or even your series A and B is the start of the story. Um, and I think what, 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 what really concerns me is that we are celebrating the fundraisers and not actually celebrating the underlying businesses being built. Um, because I think, you know, I, I see a fair amount of, um, 
um, sort of decks. I see a lot of sort of deal flow. Um, I, I'm not particularly impressed with the valuations versus the companies being built and the longevity of those companies. So I think, you know, you know, the U.S. benefited from massive expansion in, in venture capital, especially at the seed stage, because, you know, there were probably 100 plus IPOs last year. There were companies still being acquired, et cetera. There's such a depth of capital markets that they can deliver that. Whereas we're really focused on like, hey, we raised like $5 billion next year. I'm like, great. You raised $5 billion. How much in sort of you know, equity value do you need to create for that to make sense? $50 billion? Okay, wow. Where's $50 billion going to come from? Like, it has to come from somewhere. Um, so I think there's definitely is a disconnect between the money going in and the value coming out. But I think that ultimately will correct itself, right? Um, I think to, 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 my, again, to my experience, um, one, I didn't want there to be a, a long, long, long-term commitment. You know, obviously, once you, once you raise a fund, you know, you're married to those investors, like, for life, right? Um, you know, either you make money or you don't make money for them, right? I think it was much more raising it from like H&Is, not a huge amount of money from anybody. I think the, the largest check we got was like a quarter of a million dollars. Um, so it was very sort of like, you know, small capital. Um, and it was very efficient for us just to manage those relationships with people we knew, um, as opposed to go into uh, a DFI or, or sort of like, you know, a large company saying, hey, give me like $5 million. I'm going to make it like 100. Because yeah, if, if I'd done that, then I'd be basically working for investors trying to explain to them that where their money had gone, um, et cetera, et cetera. I just, I just didn't want to live that life. Celebrate fundraisers, not the uh, celebrating fundraisers, not the businesses being built. I like that. That's a great, uh, that's a great uh, insight, and that we need to do more of the celebrating of the actual ventures and the growth um, uh, and the entrepreneurs that are building those businesses. Um, and I certainly agree with you that the typology investors absolutely affects uh, the company, not least the team uh, behind it. Um, so the type of capital that you take in. Uh, can make or break a business. Uh, we certainly Absolutely. have seen some of those. Um, Mike, I'm going to come over to you in just a moment. I'm going to go to Ikena, back to Ikena one more time, because we're still in this theme about starting a business and what it takes and um, to operationalize it. And I want us to talk a little bit about the magic, uh, the golden phrase that's on every sort of seed stage company's lips, which is product to market fit. Um, and put simply, simply for the audience, uh, it's building a product that customers love and buy. Uh, that's how we think about it. But I think the important piece is how you get to that point. Um, and we've seen uh, plenty of entrepreneurs who take the route of building out the full product uh, and only then going out and trying to convince their customers to buy it. Uh, instead of, of course, we know, I think, uh, testing, uh, validating, iterating, pivoting, and continuing to test with your users is very important um, in trying to uh, build a scalable business. So, Ikenna, how have you gone about building a, a product that your customers love? And what have you learned throughout this process about the ag market in Africa? Yeah, definitely. I think we've learned, honestly, by failing a lot um, and starting off a bit arrogant and a little too intellectual um, and then bringing things down to the brass tacks and making sure you're, you're doing something that is like essential for your customers. Um, so we started off by trying to basically sell software and, and data to investors. They weren't interested. Um, and so we moved back to Nigeria. We got on ground um, and we basically started hunting for demand. That, that's the way that we think about it as a business. Um, so our, our customers are these massive consumer brands that produce, you know, all the products that you would find in a supermarket. And so the question that always started our value chain analysis was where's the demand where is the consumer brand that is saying hey if you bring me this commodity i'll pay you in advance i'll pay you the moment that it shows up at my factory etc if we go to another factory and they say i will pay you after after a week if you bring it we're not interested right like we wanted to find like a burning issue for folks and and we found that in nigeria's vegetable oil sector and that's where we then basically followed the value chain and basically looked for a bottleneck um, that was impacting the quality and the throughput of that value chain, right? So you start with demand, you start with a customer who has insatiable demand. Um, for example, the Nigerian vegetable oil market is a $3 billion market. And vegetable oil by most accounts is a, is a commodity, right? And so if you can supply vegetable oil at the right price and quality, the companies are buying it, right? And so 
when you've established strong demand, then you need to go into the value chain and look for an opportunity where you can create a differentiated operating model to secure the supply. And then you match that supply to that demand. So I think in, in different markets, it's a little bit more, it, it's different. Um, establishing demand for you know, consumer-faced products is a lot around consume, you know, convincing that consumer that the product is of interest and things like that. Um, but we play in this space of kind of B2B commodity supplies. And so we look for commodities that manufacturers are having a lot of trouble getting. And then we look to develop technology in the supply chain where we can that created uh, impact on both the producers and the customers that we serve. Fascinating. Failing a lot to get to, to a winning proposition, a proposition that works. It is the uh, process. It is the process. It is absolutely the process. You cannot cheat. You can, there's no magic bullet, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Speaking about trying and failing and trying again, um, Mike, you've written a book about this, um, Failing to Win. Maybe hand it up uh, again with, with, so that people can uh, see it. Uh, reflecting, obviously, on your own journey as an entrepreneur, but also as a leader of a startup. Um, I think you've mentioned at the start as uh, somebody who's coming to the continent from Canada um, and somebody who's really insightful uh, and self-reflective about the challenges that you've gone through. And I really admire that. I think, as I said, uh, I think I find that very powerful uh, and your openness to share the failures are very, uh, very interesting and useful to others, learn from the mistakes of others. How important is it to be transparent about one's journey uh, of being an entrepreneur? And how important is it to share the painful and the negative side of it, um, including, of course, failing, um, as opposed to only focusing on the positive case examples uh, to encourage more entrepreneurs to try? Let's start with that. So, so the, the short answer is, uh, I, I believe, very important, or I, I wouldn't have done it, but um, maybe to provide some context of how that came about, because I, I didn't actually set out to write a book or to be an author. Um, I left, uh, like, it was very, very difficult, as I mentioned, to leave this company that I, you know, built for nine years on the way up, and then one year where it went into a death spiral, and, and we, we barely managed to save it. Um, and like failing is, is very, very hard. It's very painful. And um, I, I, um, I was pretty wounded and um, like borderline depressed um, and just reflecting back. And everybody would, of course, ask, you know, the two standard questions of like, what happened? And then I would go into like a one hour monologue with sometimes some tears coming. Um, and then, of course, what are you going to do next? And I'm like, I have no idea. Right. Um, and so uh, I had some encouragement from people just saying, you just need to write this down and get it out of you, like get the story out of your head. And, and so the writing for me was a reflection. Um, and then it just, once I started, um, I, I couldn't stop. And then soon I had like this 20,000 word letter to my therapist and I, I felt way better. Um, I had my new business idea. I already had like a new deck um, for boost. And then I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done with Zona and I'm, I'm on to the next next version. But then I had this thing and it's like, well, um, the, the more people I, I talk to with um, and other entrepreneurs and founders would say like, you know, I, I can relate to all of these stories. I had an investment around collapse. I got uh, attacked by a competitor. I had co my co-founder and I like um, had a blow up and, and parted ways. Um, I, I like struggling to manage my board. Right. So everybody is going through these failing experiences, but nobody is talking about it or, or writing about it. And often the business books or entrepreneurship books um, are from a position of success. And even, even like one of my favorite, like the hard thing about hard things is one of my favorites, but it's still written by, you know, Ben Horowitz, who's obviously very successful. And at the end he's like, oh, and I had my $5 billion exit. And I'm like, then started the venture capital fund. And then I wrote a book, right? So I wanted to, to put a story out there that I think was much more real and, and authentic um, of just how hard it is. Um, and um, be motivated. Uh, I was motivated by just sharing the lessons learned because um, so much of, of what I went through and the success was rooted in the failure exactly as it kind of meant through or mentioned. It's like we all go through the same process and the same journey. And it's not even just an Africa thing or a fintech thing. It's all entrepreneurs have to like learn um learns you know all of these things and, and there is a playbook to a startup it like you there's no perfect playbook 
Um, but there's a lot of things that I think you can benefit from um, learning from failures of others um, and that can accelerate the whole ecosystem and ultimately create like stronger companies and stronger investors and, and a, a more healthier venture ecosystem. Um, but from a, a personal side, it was very personal to me. And it, um, I, I, I honestly say, I think it saved me six months of therapy and probably increased my chances of success of uh, boost by, you know, I, I would say it doubled it. If I just jumped into something without going through that reflection process. Um, and so I'm, I'm thrilled that it helps other people. That's like almost a byproduct of why I did it. No, it's amazing. And I'm sure on that last point uh, that uh, you absolutely have helped others. And uh, of course, we all know every entrepreneur's journey is very different uh, to others. Um, but reading and being inspired by somebody uh, when you're probably walking in the same uh, in the same shoes and being fearful and lonely, being an entrepreneur is lonely, uh, especially when you're a founder and, and a leader. I'm curious and, and a sort of follow-up question for you is, well, in your opinion, how does an entrepreneur decide when to keep going and yeah. when to let go and at what cost? It's, it's such a great question. Um, I've struggled um, and reflected on this for a long time. Um, I, I think the, the, the reality is as soon as you decide to leave, you're actually or exit, you're, you're six months behind. Um, and it's, it's probably the same logic of like when you decide that somebody's not fitting on your team, um, you know, and you, you look back and you're like, I knew this, right? I shouldn't have hired them or we knew the problems in the relationship weren't, weren't strong from the beginning. So, so I don't think you can really ever make a, a right decision um, and, and it's almost always too late. But um, in my, my circumstance, um, you know, I, I, my, my dog was named after my company. Uh, my Twitter handle is Zona Mike. Like my entire identity was tied up in this business. And for a long time, I was like, you know, this is what I'm going to do. Like, I'm going to take this all the way through to like, you know, build the Pan-African billion dollar business that's going to have this huge impact. And, um, and so it was really hard to come to, to, to grips that that wasn't going to happen. Um, I had some amazing mentors that, that kind of helped me realize that there was um, life after, you know, my startup, um, that, that my startup wasn't my identity, um, that failing is very different from being a failure. Um, you know, look, failing is when you look at it objectively, it's something that everybody goes through. You can learn from it. Um, being a failure gets you in a, in a very dark place. Um, so ha having those people around me um, was, was very helpful. But um, I think, the, you know, to the, the point of your question, I think every founder um, needs to really be brutally honest with themselves and have people who can give them brutal, honest feedback about, you um, you know, and it's not necessarily leaving your company or, or leaving your, but you're always letting go. So it's about when, when you're doing something that you need to, to pass the torch to somebody else and you need to either step aside a CEO or you need to hire somebody or you need to you know, step back and let go. Um, and then, and then eventually I think that gets to the point where you're, you're um, what you're good at as an individual um, doesn't no longer matches what the company needs or what the, the role you're playing to serve that company needs. Because um, if you're great at starting companies, you're probably not going to be great at actually running them when they're at scale. And if you're great at building them, you're probably, you might not be. I think we might have a technical uh, uh, failure at this point. We'll see if Mike comes back. Uh, but in the meantime, we can see Mike is muted. Are you with us, Mike? Okay, let's give him a moment. Um, Jason, maybe coming to you uh, on a, a similar topic of challenges. Um, and I was struck by how open uh, you were sort of in the media about the difficulties that Iraqa went through during the pandemic period, um, which is also obviously something that many, many, many startups and entrepreneurs have gone through. Um, can you share a little bit more about this and, and what it was like to lead the team through this period in time and talk to your shareholders, investors, you know, what were you telling your team and, and yeah, your investors during this time? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think, um, you know, there's a lot of, when you raise money, you venture back, everything is like, oh my God, we're crushing it. We're doing so well. We're going to capture the world to the moon. Like everything's so glorious. 
but again, like the, the actual work of startup every single day, it's just like, it's good, it's grind, you know, it's grinding, it's, it's hurtful. And I think it's very rare that um, you just have a rocket ship on your hands, right? Very, very rare. Like I, I've, I've seen it maybe a handful of times, even in Nigeria, the hundred plus startups that have been invested in, right? It's very, very rare that actually happens. Um, what, what I find that this is good for me is that like, if I'm struggling with something internally, then I, I'm pretty confident that somebody else is struggling with it. So I share it. That's, that's, I've been doing it for the last 10 years. I've never been one to sort of hold back. Um, I think one thing that, um, you know, being in an entrepreneurial game for what, I'm now like maybe 17 or 18 years in, um, when I, from when I first started my first venture, like it humbles you, man. Like this, like if, if, you're, if you just started yesterday, you just waste two or three million dollars, man, like you're on top of the world. Like you're going to, you know, you're going to be a billionaire. But if you've been doing it for 17 years and you've seen most of your people who, again, in our 20s, we had great dreams and great ambitions and a lot of those dreams turned to dust and humbled people and hollowed them out, you, you have a healthy respect for what it takes to actually build a company for the long term. Um, so I find that, at least for me, like I try to be um, a little contrarian in terms of like the hype and the energy. I try to be the one who's like, yo, slow down. You know, just because you, and I, I wrote this last week, just because you raised at a 50 million valuation, you know, your company doesn't worth 50 million. Yo, like, let's be real, your company has probably got $25,000 a month in, in revenue. Like, just chill. Like, we, we, we've seen it before. You, you know, go, go and build your company. Like, stop hyping on, on, on Twitter. Like, it's not about that right way. So me, me at least, I'm like, yo, like, we, we need to build stuff. It's hard. Uh, we have to be ultra transparent. I've always been transparent. I mean, to my team, they could see that something could change, right? So obviously COVID happened. Everyone thought it was a holiday. Hey man, like I get a month off work, essentially. That's kind of how a lot of people thought. So they just at home consuming content. Then the Navi devaluation started happening in Africa. Then people just stopped spending. You know, it's, it's one thing, you know, it's one thing sending your kids to school. I've, I've got three kids, right? It's one thing sending them off to school and then coming back five, six hours later. It's another thing than being in the house because they were just like eating everything. Like everything. So whatever your food budget was for the week, yo, that, that was out the window. Those kids just eat everything. So, um, you know, working, your kids destroying any sort of like money you had in your pocket and just the sort of the, the hardness of the harshness of what Nigeria typically does. Um, it, it, it was obvious at that point that our African business just wasn't viable at that point. And, you know, I, I, was, I, was, telling, I was telling somebody the other day, it's, and I tell my investors all the time when, when they kind of question some of my decisions, I'm like, yo, like, it's not like I lost and somebody else won. That, that I could understand. I'd be like, yo, they did something I didn't understand and they beat me. I, I can accept that one. But it's like everybody's losing. Like, you, like everybody's losing. Like, especially as far as in Africa. You know, I remember when Netflix came and everyone was sort of getting orgasmic. Everyone was sort of like, you know, going back and forth. But Netflix has struggled in Nigeria. Like, straight up, they have. Like, they've not set the world on fire. They have the same problems that I've been seeing for the last decade. If they just paid me some money, I would have, you know, I would have saved them probably like $50 million, right? In sort of stuff they've been doing, but they, they, you know, they want to go and find, they want to go and earn their own school fees, right? And they've learned that lesson. So I think like everybody went in there has largely failed. It's a market thing, it's a timing thing. It will get built, but I think it will get built over way longer time frames than what people expect. And I think you just have to be open. You know what? What I what I wouldn't want to happen is that like I try to quietly right size my team by like forty percent. And then I'm like, everything's fine. I'm sort of on Twitter. I'm on social media. Like, everything's fine. No, everything's not fine. I had to resize my team. And here's the reason why. I think it's, I think at least in terms of me, I'd rather control that narrative. And, you know, if, if I'm going to take a beat in it, it'd be from my own voice, not from what everybody is, somebody else has said. Um, and at least for me, like, that's just, that's just me. If, if things are good, you know, I thank God. If things are terrible, I share them on Twitter. I'm like, yo, like, man, let's try and survive until next year and take you from there, right? Um, but I, I think, like, you know, a lot of that has, has a lot of that has gone. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't really sharing their struggles um, at the moment. And that's because there's so much money in the system. Um, you know, people don't really have to do very much to raise two, three million dollars at the moment. Um, and everything's fantastic, right? And again, the crazy thing is that, especially for Nigeria, Nigeria has only had negative uh, macroeconomic indicators for the last like five years. Only in one way, everything has gone. But if you look at the tech community, it's like Christmas every single day, every single week, there's more money going in. And for me, it's like, well, they're like you, you, know, you can't outgrow the macro, right? If people don't have money, they don't have money. If, they, if, if, the, if, if, if inflation is like 15, 16, 17%, that's real, that's real value destruction. If the Naira was you know, 360 two years ago and now it's like 570 on a parallel market, 
well, I wonder how you're marking your dollar-based revenues to, 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 to market, right? Like, what, you, what? how are you guys doing that? So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of like, um, just like junk in the system that needs to work its way out. Um, and I think at the moment, um, a, a lot of the foreign investors don't even want to hear the bad news. They're just like, yo, just like the party's going, let's just keep on going, right? And I think, I think for this, you know, and I, I actually said this, it's fintech a systemic risk. And I, I write a lot and I wrote this, it's, it's fintech a systemic risk. I think it is, because I'm pretty confident that 80% of the companies out there are not going to survive. They're not really building real companies. And the market is just not there. But again, what, what I know, I'm like a long in the tooth old guy who's just sort of, you know, probably should be put out to pasture trying to find his way in the world, right? Um, but, you know, I think, look, I'm, I'm maximum transparency. That's just me by, by, by nature. Um, that's very uh, abnormal in somewhere like Nigeria where everything's fantastic, everything is smoke and mirrors. Um, but I, I know I help people because a lot of people's favorite startup founders, they come to me with very specific problems and I try to guide them. So I know behind all of the hype that we're talking about, like people are really struggling with mental health, really struggling with expectations from people around them. Um, you know, trying to understand like, well, I just got three or four million dollars. What does this mean for my life, for my family expectations? Um, you know, how do I manage it? How do I think about burn rate? Will the money always be there, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, you, know, every, you know, the last couple of years have been fantastic, but, you know, in two or three years time, will, will the funding environment still be the same? I don't believe that would be possible. So I think we need to build, we need to build real muscle. And we're not doing that at the moment. Right now, we're essentially doing like Instagram filters and we should be building like real muscle. Thank you for that. And um, I, I think the virus and the pandemic in its own right, as you have illuminated, is not just a health virus. It's an economic uh, crisis and it's a crisis of culture and social cohesion. Um, you know, the fact that we're all talking in Zoom today uh, is, is on, on the one hand, it's great because we get uh, you know, people from all over the world. But on the one, other hand, it would be great if we're sitting around uh, and, and speaking together in person. Um, on the topic of support, which I think you just uh, highlighted and, and the need to be there uh, for each other. And again, the startup community um, and by startup community, I mean both investors, entrepreneurs uh, helping each other uh, and investing time in each other and supporting each other. I'm going to open up the floor for uh, questions from the audience. And I already have a few questions. Uh, and the first one to continue as a segue into this topic of support is from uh, from Sona for Ikena. And the question is, what can we as a community do to support ActEx startups in Africa? Uh, is it around purely funding or is it something else uh, so that the space can be as successful as fintech uh, and other sectors? Ikena, what are your thoughts? Definitely. Uh, we have a motto at Relief, and it is to go see the land. So I think the best thing that you can do to support the ag tech sector in Africa is to go see it with your own two eyes. 90% um, of what you need to know, you will figure out within the first hour that you are there looking at farms, speaking with farmers, understanding how buyers, traders, logistics work. Um, and so I think there is a very valid like academic aspect to understanding these markets, um, but there is so much to be learned from just, you know, it's just a flight away is the way that I, I try and put it to people. You know, you show up with your passport, with a bag of things, you can go and see these markets. So I, I highly recommend for people that are able, really try and go and see these ag tech markets and a lot of the ideas, the problems, they will come to you um, when you're on ground and you'll be able to develop like a more discerning eye for where you have found a problem or where you have actually found the symptom of a problem. So with our business, um, we, we did a lot of reading and we saw that lots of ag tech businesses were not getting the financing that they needed. So our, our thought process was, okay, well, we then need to highlight these great businesses. Let's create uh, an innovative um, like data-based company to get information on leading ag tech companies package that information really well for international investors so that, you know, the funding will start happening. And the more information we collected and collected and collected, the, the reality started to look like, you know, these companies need to be doing something in their real operations to improve profitability. Like the problem is, you know, people invest where money is being made, right? And so if you see a large financing gap, that is a symptom of a, of a deeper root cause and you need to go and find what that root cause the problem is and develop 
uh, a solution and an operating model around that problem and turn it into an advantage. Go see the land. I'm going to steal that one, Ikenna. Yeah, and, and you heard it here first. Ikenna is inviting all of us uh, to his home in Lagos to go see the <laughs> land. <laughs> Invite is well taken. We'll be there. Absolutely. We'll be on the plane. Um, well, so talking uh, a little bit more about this kind of engagement um, and, and, and being aware of what is happening on the ground uh, and, and who are the boots on the ground. Mike, there's a question for you from Akalemwa, and the question is, can you share a little bit more about some of your early stakeholder engagement strategies uh, in Zambia, especially when it comes to the regulators and the, uh, the governments there? Um, yeah, good, good, good question. Um, so, and, and maybe I can uh, contrast this a little bit with, with my current company, Boost, because um, like Zona, my former company started back in 2009. So it was a long time ago um, when there was no regulation for fintech. And we had to uh, get one of the very first, um, I think it was actually the second license that was, was issued as a payment system that they created uh, for a previous company called CellPay. Um, so uh, we, we were like very much part of the, the formation of regulation, but just one, one of the lessons learned um, in the journey there was uh, to get the regulators on your side and be like proactive. It was always what, uh, if you're in a regulated space, uh, because often regulators are, are people and they, everybody's trying to dodge them all the time. So when, if you actually take a proactive approach, um, it depends on the market, but like we had a lot of success and built strong alliances and became quite a um, almost a proud brand where the regulator could could say, "Hey, like Zona is always the company, on us and we support them, and they're doing all this like great great work and having this great impact." Um, my my current company Boost is um, the ecosystems changed, and I think when you're starting a business, um, uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, not say this too too bluntly, but like. You, you almost you don't want to get involved in the regulatory discussion from the beginning because um, you want to make sure you have, first of all, like product market fit and second of all, a business um, and doing a lot of testing and, and trying to figure out like how um, how you can actually get those things. Whereas if you go regulator first and you're just trying to find like a, get a license or engaging like those big stakeholders, you'll just move too slow. Um, so I, I think it's important to have a strategy, but don't let it be a, a blocker to starting maybe the advice I would give. Don't dodge the regulators. Befriend them. Is what yeah. I'm yeah. Be, be, befriend them, but just pick your moment, maybe. <laughs> it's all about timing. Thank okay. you, Mike. Um, we've got a question coming in uh, for Jason. Uh, Jason, uh, there is the perception that you're no longer bullish on venture capital. Uh, so the question is, if you would encourage young and up-and-coming entrepreneurs in Africa to fundraise uh, from VC, um, as, of course, the ecosystem is growing uh, very rapidly and it's very, quote-unquote, easy to raise capital, what are your views? So, look, I think more young people getting access to capital is a fantastic thing because more amazing stuff will get built. So I'm bullish on young people getting their hands on money. Um, for, to, to me, if somebody, if somebody, let's say, raises $10 million and then next week or six months later, they raise $50 million and then six months after that, they raise $100 million and they're bragging that, yo, I still have the money in the bank. I'm like, that's fucking stupid. Like, well, like I don't understand. If you still have $50 million in the bank, why are you raising $100 million? I don't understand. Like, what, what, like, is that a good use of your time? And I think for me, I think that if you look at some of the best companies ever built, they didn't require huge amounts of capital. Like Google raised $30 million and it's, you know, a trillion plus dollars company now, right? You know, Amazon did raise a huge amount. And this was when building startups was expensive, really expensive, when you literally had to go and build, build your own server farms and maintain your own um, sort of CDNs, et cetera, right? So I genuinely don't understand what they're doing with this money. Is it marketing? Like if you need to spend $2 million a month on marketing, then perhaps your product isn't quite working right. And I think there are very, businesses, very few businesses that require you to spend huge amounts of money on marketing, right? So I think there needs to be a, um, there, there needs to be a, a really open discussion around, well, if I raise $5 million, $5 million is a, a lot of money 
first and foremost, right? So if I raise five million dollars, can I get me to where I want to do build in terms of a company? Yes or no? If it's no, you go and raise more. Is it 20? Is it 50? Like, I don't know. I don't think there are very many companies that need $100 million plus to be built. Like, I, I just don't see it. I don't know what you're spending the money on, but I, I, don't, I don't see it. Um, and it's just more a question of because there is more money there, as opposed to it being what you're actually going to do with it. Um, and again, I, I think in, 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 in the US, the US has one of those really peculiar markets where there is just like such a depth of their capital markets and such a big economy that like anything crazy, someone can basically put a billion dollars down. Like US companies, if they, if they were very aggressive and you know, bought something for $500 million, they'll first be you know, applauded for it. In Africa, like, no, you need to show some like real revenue. They want to see some EBITDA, they want to see some sustainability, they want to see all of those things, right? So I think you know, we're essentially borrowing a, a US sort of centric model of sort of rapid scale, when in reality, like, what are the exits for those companies, right? Um, and I think, in the end, um, again, the, the game has changed now where you can raise money and as an entrepreneur, you don't even have to, you can make two, you can, as an entrepreneur, you can make two or three million dollars by selling secondaries within the first two or, three million, uh, two or three years of the company without really having any real success other than raising money. So I get there is an incentive to do that. But I think it's, uh, again, if we get to 2025 and we're still counting you know, one or two exits per year, then as an ecosystem, we have fundamentally failed. And I think, you know, NASPERS, now the fact that NASPERS are no longer invested in Africa is probably the biggest example of like how risky that could be, right? Again, when I was, when I was coming up, the biggest investors weren't the people who invest in now. In fact, none of the people really um, uh, are, are, are the biggest investors who invested back then. I'm talking about like obviously NASPERS, Intel Capital, Shinovic, Etc. Right, you know, a lot of there's a lot of sort of like a corporate venture capital. So, you know, Mastercard put money into um, in, 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 into uh, Jumia, um, uh, Pino, uh, Pino. I think I can't remember the name of the drinks company put money in there. Like, you know, Axel was putting money in there. Goldman was putting money in there. So, at least during my first five years in Iwaka, all of those big investors, none of them are still big investors now. That that was a problem. So imagine by 2025, if we haven't built real value. With real, um, with real uh, exit sort of uh, optionality, the investors they will stop investing. They'll just go back to investing in the US, in India, in 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 in, in China, etc. Um, because again, you will you typically see is that in India, their companies are listed on their own exchanges. So the 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 the, um, the, the India stock exchange essentially can support ten billion dollar companies. Nigerian stock exchange can't do that. Egypt Egypt uh, Egyptian stock exchange can support you know a billion dollar company like Nigerian company. I don't think it can do that. So I think we need to be really careful that we don't um, we don't over-index for funding and actually forget that we're building a business. So I think every entrepreneur needs to know what their North Star is. If you want to spend 10 years building a business and try to build success and have a successful outcome, then you do that. But I think raising money shouldn't be the barometer of success. And right now, that seems to be the only barometer of success. And for me, that's, that's again, I'm, I'm old school, right? Um, and also, I, I see what happens when people stop giving you money. Um, so when people stop giving you money, your company kind of goes to, the, goes to zero very quickly. Um, so I'm just, I, I try to at least be, you know, the one person who's essentially like screaming into the wind that, hey, look, man, we're going to build a company here. You're going to build a company. You know, you're an African startup. They're not going to just, just because, they're, 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 just because some cool tech, no one's going to drop a half a billion dollars on you. They want to see like real revenue, real like value, like EBITDA or some degree of sustainability, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I'm just, I'm just trying to almost like remind the ecosystem that we actually have a lot of work to do and it's not raising money that's the um, that's the uh, that's the work but right now unfortunately like I'm, I'm one of the few people who are saying that right and that's fine as well raising money is not the only barometer of success um, well said famous last words let's build amazing businesses with amazing entrepreneurs and I'm afraid we're out of time Timing is everything. Uh, I want to thank uh, my three esteemed panelists uh, for your insight, for your inputs, for your comments. Uh, Ikenna from Relief, uh, Jason from Morocco, and Mike uh, from Boost Technologies. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful uh, session and a Friday afternoon or evening for some of us. And I look forward to seeing you all in person sometime soon at Ikenna's so house much. in Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Alina. See you soon. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye-bye.